Welcome to this presentation titled Passing of the Torch, The Legacy of Henry George Jr. I'm Edward J. Dotson. History records many instances of sons following in the footsteps of their fathers. In the case of Henry George Jr., from the time he reached adulthood, he had essentially completed his apprenticeship and became a junior partner in the movement his father initiated to change the course of history. Here is Henry with his mother, Annie Corsina Fox George. He was born on the 3rd of November 1862 in Sacramento, California. At the time, his parents were struggling financially. His father was back working as a printer after selling his share in a struggling newspaper. He described his circumstance in a letter to his sisters. Up to a couple of months ago, I could not get enough to do, but since then the Overland Mail has been arriving with great regularity, and I have not missed a day. Had not my necessities been so great, I would not have worked as I have during that time, for no one can do so for any time and retain good health. On the day Henry was born, his father was taking tickets at the door for a lecture delivered by Samuel Clemens. The George family soon moved to San Francisco, where his father obtained employment setting type for several different newspapers, eventually acquiring part ownership of the Evening Journal in 1864. And yet at the end of the year, he informed his landlord he had no money with which to pay the rent owed by the family. The family's circumstances only worsened, as Henry's father later recalled. I came near starving to death, and at one time I was so close to it that I think I should have done so but for the job of printing a few cards which enabled us to buy a little cornmeal. Despite the family's continuing financial struggles, Henry's father was set to leave the family to join an expedition to assist Mexicans fighting for independence from France. Fortunately, the opportunity arose for steady work as a typesetter for the state government, where he remained until near the end of 1866, when he joined the staff of the San Francisco Times. After completing his education in public schools, Young Henry went to work at age 16 in a printing office. Here he is in 1870 at age 8. After the publication of his father's book, Progress and Poverty, in 1879, Henry joined the family's relocation to New York, where they established residence in Brooklyn. Henry's father was already there where he had become a Democratic Party speaker on the controversial subject of tariffs. By the beginning of 1881, the sales of progress and poverty were growing, yet the family continued to struggle financially, most of his income coming from lecture fees. Then came the opportunity to go to Ireland and England, leaving Henry and his brother Richard at home in New York. The future of his two sons had to be addressed before the political economist departed. As Henry's father later wrote, The problem was how to employ them during the separation. The younger one, Dick, it was settled, was to return to school, and with the elder, Harry, the question was whether he should be put in a newspaper office or be sent to Harvard College where special considerations at the time had let down the bars to poor men's sons. What his father told Henry determined the direction of the son's life. Going to college, you will make life friendships, but you will come out filled with much that will have to be unlearned. Going to newspaper work, you will come in touch with the practical world, will be getting a profession and learning to make yourself useful. Henry went to work for the Brooklyn Eagle as a local reporter. Returned from his speaking tour of Ireland and Britain, Henry's father was more active than ever. 
He and others started an organization called the Free Soil Society. The entire family, Henry included, were among the first members. In 1884, Henry accompanied his father on a second trip to Britain as his personal secretary. He is said to have spent some time on the staff of the London Truth before returning to the United States to begin work for the North American Review. During his father's 1886 campaign to become the next mayor of New York City, Henry's education in the practical world of party and issue politics was nurtured. After the election, Henry's father announced his intention to start a new weekly newspaper to be named The Standard. Henry joined the staff of the paper as correspondence editor. In the 8 January 1887 issue of the paper, Henry offered his perspectives on whether cities should provide free rail service to residents. The true and the only way to supply the best service with the greatest economy is for the public to assume ownership and control of the railroads and make them a department of the government, conducted as the post office and the public schools are. Such a change would at once abolish all stock watering and no such state of affairs as one line blocking another would occur. Henry had developed into a person of deep intellect and demonstrated integrity. More and more, he joined with his father and others as a leading member of the single tax community. He became the managing editor of The Standard, authoring an endless stream of hard-hitting articles and editorials. In the summer of 1889, Henry's father and family were in Europe. Back home, Henry came under fire from two of the senior staff members, T.L. McCready and J.W. Sullivan, who wrote an attack on the Standard's editorial positions printed in the new weekly 20th Century, published by U. Pentecost, a one-time ally of the senior Henry George. Sullivan accused Henry's father of copying much of what was in progress in poverty from Patrick Edward Dove's book, The Theory of Human Progression. Henry reprinted Sullivan's accusations in the Standard, and his father responded in detail. He concluded his response with the following statement. When I first came to see what is the root of our social difficulties and how this fundamental wrong might be cured in the easiest way by concentrating taxes on land values, I had worked out the whole thing myself without conscious aid that I can remember. When I published Our Land and Land Policy, I had not even heard of the physiocrats and the impo unique but I knew if it was really a star I had seen, others must have seen it too. And as I have heard of such men, one after the other, I have felt that they gave the additional evidence that we were indeed on the true track, and still more clearly showed that though against us were ignorance and power, yet behind us were hope and faith and the vision of the ages the deepest and clearest perceptions of man. As Henry's father began work in 1891 on the book that would become the science of political economy, Pope Leo XIII released an encyclical that challenged the analysis of Henry's father. In New York, Cardinal Manning told Henry personally that the Pope's encyclical was aimed at his father's teachings. A formal response came from his father, the condition of labor, an open letter to Pope Leo XIII. From time to time, the Standard would publish individual monographs in an effort to attract attention to important social issues with public policy implications. One of these extras, written by Henry George Jr. in February of 1892, reported on a Consensus Bureau examination of the extent to which rising land prices affected the ownership of homes and farms in the western United States. Henry ends with a forecast of future findings. When the investigation comes east, it is the expectation that a very much worse state of things will be revealed, for there concentrating tendencies have been longer at work 
When examination comes to the great cities, it will not be surprising if the condition discovered resembles that known to have existed in Rome when the landed nobles bought the suffrages of the landless, impoverished, and embruted masses with bread and cheeses. Henry next reported on public hearings on a bill introduced by Representative Tom L. Johnson that would shift taxation in the District of Columbia from improvements to land values. The 1890s was a difficult decade for the cause Henry had come to embrace as his life's work. His father, in almost constant motion around the United States and on international travel, finally suffered a serious stroke in the fall of 1890. Anna George DeMille explained what happened in her 1950 biography of her father. The trouble now was overwork. Nerve strain had resulted in a slight hemorrhage in the part of the brain in which the center of speech is located. His mind was clear, yet sometimes in speaking he would use the wrong word or interject an alien word. The newspaper started by Henry's father had just come under new leadership. William Crosdale was now editor. Henry eventually found new work as editor of the Jacksonville, Florida the Citizen, where he remained through 1895. Then in 1897 came the death of Henry's father, collapsing while campaigning a second time to become mayor of New York City. Of her father, Anna wrote shortly thereafter, My father was my religion, my ideal of a man, the link which drew me nearer to God. My father was not a religious man, but I know he believed in God. There may have been a time when he did not. Nearly all of us have to go through that sometime in our lives. But toward his last years, he did. Henry was drafted to take his father's place on the ballot. Perhaps not surprisingly, he finished a distant fourth with just 22,000 votes. Still, there was important work for Henry as the manuscript of his father's final work, The Science of Political Economy, required some editing before it was ready for publication. As Henry explained in an introductory note, The Science of Political Economy, if entirely finished as planned by the author, would have shown Book 5 on Money Extended and the nature and function of the law of wages, interest, and rent fully considered in Book 4. But the work as left was, in the opinion of its author, in its main essentials completed. The broken parts, to quote his own words a few days before his death, indicating the direction in which my thought was tending. In December of 1898, Henry wrote a long article for the National Single Taxer assessing the state of the single tax movement. He urged his comrades to think in terms of the long struggle to come. To many in the single tax movement, the year has brought keen disappointments, but they should reflect on the century and observe that great events require great periods. All we who see have to do is to hold to the truth and do all that is within our power and leave the rest to time. Still devoted to his father's legacy, Henry provided the first detailed biography, published in 1900. Henry was now a fairly regular contributor to Lewis F. Post's weekly newspaper, The Public. It was clear to Henry that the nation had succumbed to the determined efforts of monopolists to dictate the distribution of wealth. In a November 1901 letter to the German land reformer Adolf de Mosk, Henry wrote, The country is now in the throes of great speculation. The march of concentration has within the last few years been amazingly quickened, as shown in the merging of railroads, of illuminating plants, of means of communication, and such industrial process as we have at their foundation some important principle of monopoly like the possession of mines, of oil wells, of forests, of special agreements with railroads, or of the so-called protection of the customs tariff, 
which, preventing competition from without, confines the supply of domestic needs to domestic producers. Henry then warned an international readership that hard times were on the horizon and that the cause was speculation-driven land prices. In the May 1902 issue of the Westminster Review, he wrote, The price that labor and capital must give to engage productively with land becomes too great to encourage them to remain active. Land gets too much of the fruits of production, labor and capital too little, distinguishing capital from monopoly, of course. Labor and capital, therefore, stop producing, the more abruptly if some extra burden is suddenly thrown upon them, such as increased taxes of any kind or a changed currency. With the end of the 19th century arose concern over the closing of the frontier, as detailed in articles written by historian Frederick Jackson Turner. Turner's 1893 paper, The Significance of the Frontier in American History, had been read before the American Historical Association in Chicago. Turner acknowledged but did not expound on the land question so central to the Georgist analysis. The immigrant was attracted by the cheap lands of the frontier, and even the native farmer felt their influence strongly. Year by year, the farmers who lived on soil whose returns were diminished by unrotated crops were offered the virgin soil of the frontier at nominal prices. The competition of the unexhausted cheap and easily tilled prairie lands compelled the farmer either to go west and continue the exhaustion of the soil on a new frontier or adopt intensive culture. The apparent but not actual closing of the U.S. frontier had not escaped Henry's attention either. In a 1903 article appearing in Boyce's Weekly and reprinted in the public, he wrote about the living conditions of those he encountered traveling by train across the West. The masses of men are cut off from access to the soil save at an increasing price, and more and more men cannot pay the price. They cannot become fixed to the soil, but are compelled to roam about in quest of work. They roam and roam until hope dies within them, and pride is smothered. Then they become human coyotes called tramps. A much reprinted essay by Henry first appeared the next year, titled Jefferson and the Land Question. Henry traced the development of Jefferson's thinking on the land question, repeating Jefferson's belief that, quote, our governments will remain virtuous as long as there are vacant lands in any part of America. As the year 1905 advanced, Henry warned of signs that yet another cyclical downturn could be coming. Stock market speculation is active again, and another short era of inflations may be expected in Wall Street. But most active of all is speculation in land. In the cities, this activity is quite plain. The real estate departments in most of the newspapers in the larger cities speak glowingly of the rising real estate prices and consequent prosperity of the community. Hence, we may look forward soon to the crippling of industrial operations by the speculative rise of land values. Henry finished working on his own major commentary on social and economic conditions, The Menace of Privilege, published in 1905. In the preface, he informed readers of the positions he would take and support with evidence. This volume strives to show in a brief, suggestive way how privileges granted or sanctioned by government underlie the social and political, mental and moral manifestations that appear so ominous in the Republic. The monopoly of natural opportunities, heavy taxes upon production, private abuse of public services, and other lesser privileges cause the great inequalities in the distribution of wealth which are evident all about. For these are not powers to produce wealth, but powers to appropriate it. The book was generously reviewed and apparently sold well. 
an unsigned review in Leslie's Weekly described what Henry had accomplished. The work is thoughtful, well-written, and temperate in tone, and as an earnest attempt to solve a difficult problem deserves careful and respectful study. Henry now began a lecture tour to promote the book. At the same time, he became very interested in the modernization efforts occurring in Japan. He was hired by the Times Magazine to visit Japan and report back on what he found. His first report appeared in the December 1906 issue, in which he described the efficiency of the government rail system. We hear it very frequently stated by the advocates of private operation in the United States that government management would prove inefficient and expensive. It has not proved so in Japan. On the contrary, if anything, the government service, considering it as a whole, take the lead. I am persuaded that the private service is as good as it is, mainly because the government service sets a high standard which the other must follow. Upon his return to the United States, he was interviewed by Joseph Dana Miller, editor of the Single Tax Review. Asked about the wages paid to Japanese workers, Henry responded, Wages are rising in some particular lines, but the cost of living has been enormously increased, and rents in the cities have advanced by leaps and bounds. The common things of life cost much more. As for any understanding of and interest in the single tax idea, Henry wrote, For a number of years, Dr. Wukachi Taguchi, member of the House of Representatives of the Imperial Diet and editor of the Tokyo Economic Gazette, earnestly and persistently taught the faith. He was a man of much learning, high character, and wide influence, and many listened and understood. But great was the confusion in the workshop of the nation that was melting down the old and from it forging the new civilization. It was then that Dr. Taguchi died, yet he left disciples, and in Tokyo there exists what is called the Land Right Restoration Society, of which Mr. Ito Nataro is manager. This organization does not pretend to be large in membership or rich in purse, but it is to the best of its ability making appeal to the brothers and sisters on earth to witness the truth of the great right of humankind to the land. Henry returned to Japan in 1909 to study why so many Japanese were leaving Japan for the United States. He then paid a visit to Leo Tolstoy in Russia, who told Henry, I shall never see you again, but I soon shall see your father. What message shall I carry him from you? To which Henry responded, Tell him I am carrying on his work, and he will understand. Henry returns to enter politics, standing for election to the U.S. House of Representatives from part of New York City. He ran as a Democrat, but was also strongly endorsed by the Independence League. Victorious over the Republican incumbent, Henry hoped for a social awakening, and by early April had given 60 addresses in nine different states. He emerged more optimistic than ever. To me, my election means a new thing in New York politics. We waged a radical fight. We did not flinch for one second. We admitted all they charged against us as to free trade and the single tax. We have shown that in this conservative part of Manhattan, a radical can be elected to Congress. On the 10th of June, 1911, Henry delivered a major speech in the U.S. House of Representatives the road to freedom, free trade, and a single tax to open the avenues of production. The speech was in support of a bill to reduce tariff duties on wool and wool products. Henry expanded the debate considerably. 
To him that produceth, to him should go the fruits thereof. I am a single taxer. I do not believe in taxes upon any kind of industry or upon anything that comes from industry. I believe the whole burden of taxation, federal, state, and municipal, should fall upon monopoly. I believe it should fall upon the mother of all monopolies, upon the earth, upon that value which comes to any piece of land, not by reason of the toil of its owner, for all improvements should be exempted, but from the development of the community, from social growth and social improvement. Later in the year, Henry made a long way to return visit to San Francisco, California. A banquet was held in his honor by the San Francisco Single Tax Society. The day following, he addressed more than 1,000 students and other guests on the campus of the University of California. Henry won re-election in 1912 by a significant majority over candidates of the Republican and Bull Moose parties. At the end of 1913, he introduced a bill calling for annual and full value assessments of real property in the District of Columbia. This would not result in the exemption of improvements from taxation. However, as land values increased, the bill would have the effect of raising far more revenue from the taxation of land values than had ever been the case. Sadly, at the peak of his importance as a public servant, Henry experienced what Joseph Dana Miller later described as a nervous breakdown that left him an invalid. During the summer of 1916, he had been at the family's home in Marywell Park, New York, returning to Washington, D.C. in mid-September. He lingered on until the 14th of November when he died at his home. He was just 54 years old. President Woodrow Wilson said a letter of condolence to Henry's wife. It is with the deepest and most sincere grief that I hear of the death of your husband. I learn to have a genuine and affectionate regard for him. I join with you in lamenting the loss of a sincere and admirable man and beg to extend to you my warmest sympathy. Henry had met his wife, Celine Armstrong Harmon in Chicago, where her family had moved to from New Orleans. Her parents were early followers of Henry's father. She supported him in his mission and lived on until 1969.